Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, good evening everyone. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Estimate and Taxation for September 2011. Um, item two uh, comes before us, which normally would be the uh, non-routine and routine applications. Um, but tonight uh, we're here to fill uh, the vacancy of Nancy Barton, who recently informed us uh, that she would not be uh, fulfilling her term uh, due to uh, personal reasons. We certainly wish Nancy the best. Uh, my understanding is if you wish to uh, communicate with Nancy, certainly uh, your uh, thoughts and wishes can be sent uh, directly to her at her home uh, in Old Greenwich. And so uh, once again, we wish Nancy well and, and we hope to see her around. Uh, certainly I miss her advice and uh, the discussions that we've had. Um, so hopefully she's watching tonight and I'll get a call tomorrow telling me what I did wrong today. Um, <laughs> which would be great. Um, in any event, um, is there a motion to uh, fill Nancy's vacancy? Mr. Simon. It's on, Mary. Thank you. I move that we appoint Mary Lee Kiernan to the, to the Board of Estimate Taxation effective September 12, 2011. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Simon, second by Mr. Finger. Discussion. Just so that everybody understands the process, uh, it's the BET as a body who uh, elects the successor to anybody who does not fill their term. Uh, historically, uh, the uh, uh, nomination comes from the party of which the member who has resigned is from. Um, and in fact, uh, I believe the last time that this was done uh, might have been, might have been me. Uh, Back in 99, you filled no, the position no, as well? Phil. When Jim resigned. Oh, when Jim, okay. When Jim, alas, resigned. So. And Bill uh, Finger. And Bill Finger. Finger. Captain Lamar. Huh? I think I might have been elected. <laughs> 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 see, see, everyone thinks we get elected, or not for that matter, but it, in fact, we just get appointed. Um, and it's all self appointments here. Um, in any event, um, all those in favor of Mary Lee Kiernan signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Welcome, Mary Lee. Thank you. I would also note that uh, Mary Lee will be on the ballot uh, in November. Uh, she's one of two who are on the ballot uh, uh, coming on new to the BET. And um, so we welcome her not only for the remaining term, but, but then uh, uh, prospectively. 10 0 0. 10 0 0. I know Mr. Kelly indicated to me that he was uh, going to be late. He had a mediation today in New York. Ms. Kiernan did not vote, so 10-0-0. Uh, zero, zero. Item three now comes before us, uh, consideration of non-routine applications. I call upon uh, our de facto chair of our law committee, again, uh, due to the absence of Ms. Barton, uh, uh, Jim Campbell. Uh, SE1 uh, is our first non-routine application from the first selectman's office. It's an additional appropriation in the matter of Shapiro versus the town of Greenwich for $7,500. And I so move on behalf of the law committee. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Campbell, second by Mr. Mason. Uh, comes before us a call upon our budget committee chairman, Mike Mason. NW1 for Nathaniel Witherell, a reallocation of funds of $5,000, and I so move that on behalf of the budget committee. Seconded by Mr. Simon. Uh, discussion, if I may. Nathaniel will want, uh, Nathaniel Witherell, item number one. This is a reallocation of funds that were released by our board back in July. The original release was to continue architect work in order to, buy, to provide Health Dimensions Group enough material to assist in their report to us and additionally have enough work completed for land use approvals. Since we are specific in our release, the release did not cover small amounts of legal costs necessary 
So the purpose of the, so that will be the purpose of this request. Our vote was 4-0 in favor of this item going forward. And if I just may add a, a comment, uh, the Nathaniel Willow Board has had, uh, the building committee has had an appropriation for quite some time. And <coughs> in the progress of Nathaniel Willow had been asked to just sit tight on that. And they came back to us for a release of 100,000, which this board approved. And it was specific for architectural work. <coughs> so during the summer months during this, they needed to do this small amount in legal. So they wanted to come back and, and get this cleared up. So with that, our vote was 4-0 in favor. Is there any discussion of the item before us? Mr. Huffman? Yeah, I uh, expressed a concern to be not as to the amount or to the uh, reallocation of funds, but for the fact that uh, these are being used to engage a firm of attorneys, which has on numerous occasions uh, been uh, representing parties in front of or opposed to the town. And I think that that's a conflict of interest at least in perception that we should not address. Okay, staying on that point, is there any comment to Mr. Huffman's uh, point?
Opposed? Abstentions. 11 0 0. Item 4 now comes before us routine applications. I will call upon our clerk, Joe Pellegrino. Those four items have been moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Raymer. Uh, discussion on any one of the four routine applications. Uh, once again, these are all either approvals to use grants or approval to accept the gift. Uh, they do not uh, come from the general fund uh, in terms of an additional appropriation. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. 11-0-0. Item 5 now comes before us, the assessor's report. Here tonight, our town assessor and the assistant town assessor. Ted Courtney and Bob Schiff. Good evening, gentlemen. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Board of Estimate and Taxation. Um, this evening, I want to report on the work that uh, we're undergoing at this time to prepare the 2011 grand list. And... Um, we're doing the final work on real estate additions, new construction, and we try to complete that by Thanksgiving of each year. The values reflect oct what, what was on site and what the values were as of October 1st of 2011, but we actually com complete the real estate grand list at Thanksgiving time, and the personal property and automobile grand lists are completed uh, just after the first of the year. All of them then are uh, produced in hard form and signed by the end of January. So we're on target at this point. Uh, we have um, proceeded with uh, um, inspecting uh, the majority of the new construction in real estate and picking up the, uh, the automobiles and personal property. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. For discussion concerning the assessor's report. Mr. Simon. Two questions. Um, where do you think we are in terms of the grand list growth for this year? Uh, we are estimating the grand list growth this year at approximately 169 um, million. Million dollars. Billion dollars. Million dollars. <laughs> uh, that's an increase of 0.67%. In 2009, we had an increase of 0.73%, um, so it's about on par with 2009. Okay, and up slightly from your original estimate. And then on the last page of your report, um, which is the valid residential sales statistics? Yes. Um, could we just go through what we're supposed to determine from the top chart 
especially where it says the number of sales and ratio standard deviation? But you can see that in July we had uh, 62 sales and in August, uh, not through the end of August, but up until the last week of August, we had 69 sales. And you can see the tracking on the uh, left-hand side of the chart of what the, uh, the deviations were, the sales ratio deviations. Right hand side. Could you just explain perhaps what this means? I have no idea what this means. Okay, on the top chart? Yes, what the right hand side means. Okay. Um, the right hand side is the ratio of the selling, the sale against the fair market standard deviation. Um, in, in essence, we're looking at the selling price on the bottom chart. We're like actually comparing the selling price to the assessment. And on the top chart, we're comparing the ratio of the sale uh, against the um, standard deviation. My suggestion, since I don't think anybody on this board is going to grasp that, including me, I mean, this isn't really helpful unless anybody, no, is it better if it's minus or is it better if it's positive? What does it mean? Um, <clears throat> the, pro probably the, the lower uh, it is, the better it would be. Probably. And then on the bottom chart, the higher the line says that this says houses are selling for more than what we assessed them for? That's correct. So this would show in, uh, let's look at here, in April, May, June, July, and August, house prices are 5% higher than what you thought they were on October 1st. Uh, uh, approximately, yes. That's the. The top line, the blue line, is the um, uh, the average deviation. The median deviation are, are the bars. So the median is uh, less than 5%, but the uh, average is 5%. And the median would be, but, but almost all the median values since April forward are above 1.0, showing house prices are above where they were in October. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. North. Yes. Uh, Ted, I want to address the administrative software that's recently been installed, which is item five on your report. Yes. First off, did we do a test of that installation? Have we done a test, that, which was the issue that uh, we encountered uh, a year ago when <clears throat> there was a lack of coordination or integration of the, the various systems? But have we done a test to prove that this system works and it's, uh, it's valid for us? Uh, Yes, we've had the ability to test it for the last three months. We've done a number of tests. We've identified some areas where the system needs to be improved for the users in Connecticut, and they're now working on those improvements. But the basic system, uh, from our standpoint, works. Okay. The, the second question I have involves the second paragraph and, and the uh, investigating alternate software or better system. Uh, where were we at that stage? And I, you indicate that you're going to be the lead in, in doing this. Is the assessor's office and the uh, IT office, uh, the IT department going to be involved in, in, in that search? Yeah, the, tax, the tax collector will be the lead, and the assessor and the IT will be uh, supporting him. What is the time frame on that effort? Do you anticipate being, will be the time frame? Uh, this later this this fiscal year in Q3 or Q4 they haven't determined a specific date yet they'll be putting out a uh, an RFP and they think they're looking at spring of 2012 so that's Q, the fourth quarter okay. thank you further discussion on the assessor's report is there a motion to approve so moved, so moved. moved by Ms. Tarkington second by Mr. Mason discussion all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Uh, Mr. Mason, I if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to make a motion to take uh, Mr. Courtney's uh, evaluation out of order, out of item 13, to take that up now in the interest of his schedule. Is there, uh, is there a second to Mr. Mason's motion? Second. Second by Mr. Campbell. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention.
suspensions. All right, 11 zero <coughs> here to take it out of order. This is taking up one half of the last bullet point of item 13, which is approval of the assessor's performance evaluation and salary. Uh, is there a motion to, is there a motion relative to Mr. Courtney's evaluation of salary? And I'd like to make a motion. Mr. Uh, Pellegrino. Um, on the salary first. Yes, if I may, on the salary, I'd like to make a motion that it be resolved that the assessor's salary be increased from $129,357 to $131,672, effective July 1st, 2011. And that's based on the evaluation and the approval of that evaluation? That's correct. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second by Ms. Tartan. Discussion. Should we approve the uh, evaluation first? The, the, the amount for the second one out of order? Well, I said it was it was based on it. Do we want to take okay. two separate votes? Do people no, feel the no. need to take up no. two separate votes or no. just wrap it up in one okay. vote? One vote. So if the, the motion the motion will read here, if I may. Uh, resolve that the assessor's salary be increased from one twenty nine three fifty seven to one thirty one six seventy two, effective July first, two thousand one. Uh, 2011, uh, and that the evaluation be approved uh, herewith. Yes. Fair enough? Fair enough. Uh, Maria, do you have that? Excellent. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstention. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brody. Item six now comes before us. The comptroller's report. Our town comptroller. Good evening. Chairman Arsene. I'd like to bring your attention to the page five, the very last paragraph. Um, uh, written in RFP, request for proposal for financial advisory services. The incumbent is the IBIC, also known as the uh, Independent Bond Investment Consultants. Uh, the deadline is September 14th. Uh, the panel will be Roland Geiger, Kathleen Murphy, and myself. And after the interviews, we will bring a recommendation to uh, Mr. Chairman Norton's uh, group, the Investment uh, Advisory Committee, in early October uh, to either uh, continue on with IBIC or select a new financial advisor. The financial advisor deals basically with the, the borrowings, the financing, the short-term notes, and the, uh, the bond, general obligation bonds. Uh, subsequent to this, there's going to be a flurry of activity with RFPs. The auditor's contract is up this year, and uh, we'll be issuing an RFP for the uh, auditors. We'll be working with the, again, the, uh, the audit committee, uh, another one of uh, Chairman Norton's uh, committees. Uh, I understand there might be a, a different set of players uh, af after January. So we'll have the auditor's RFP in January, and then both the actuary's RFPs uh, are up. And, um, uh, Hooker and Holcomb is the incumbent for the uh, OPEB actuary report and EFI for the pension uh, actuary report, and we'll be doing them in January. And then uh, the insurance brokerage uh, contract will be up this uh, June 30th. The incumbent is Franklin Company. We'll be doing an RFP uh, early next year in January, February, and March. Franklin Company is the insurance broker that goes out and competitively bids all the insurance uh, programs for both the town and the Board of Education. And then finally, uh, if uh, subsequent to the completion of the uh, presentation from the Hay Group and with the uh, hiring of a risk manager, we're going to also look at the KERMA contract. We're going to put the uh, third party administration of the workers' compensation and the liability auto and property contracts out uh, after January 1st of next year. So we've got five uh, RFPs that will be going out uh, next year after January 1st. And we'll be finishing this one up uh, all on the finance side. And we'll be current with all of the, uh, the contracts under the purview of the, uh, fi the BET. Any other questions in the controller's report? I'll answer them now. Discussion. Is Mr. Hoffman? Just a question. Uh, what is your impression of the number of responses you're likely to get to RFP coming in on that basis? Do you have a sense that the several hundred are interested in this? I know that for a fact that uh, Webster Bank, uh, Phoenix, IBIC, and PFM, uh, I can't remember the, the acronym, there's definitely going to be four responses. I don't think we'll get as many as uh, 10. 
I would guess five or six. Further discussion, Mr. Simon. Can you, can you give a range of the cost that we spend on bank counseling for now? Uh, I'm sorry? A range of the cost. How much does it cost? Well, how much do we pay ICIB annually? Oh, uh, they, they have a schedule. Uh, I, I believe it's $20,000 for a bond issue, and it's, it's like $5,000 for a uh, note issue. And then there's the other costs for the credit rating uh, groups, uh, both different for a bond or a band issue. And when, these, when they do bid, they're all going to come in identical. So it's, it's the, the, the rating for the cost is probably going to be identical for all of them. They're all gonna, they all know what they charge. And they're all going to uh, probably bid the same cost for these, the bond and the band issues. Where the town absorbs the most cost is, is the cost for the bond council. We currently have Robson Cole uh, as the bond council for the uh, financings, but the finance department does not pick uh, the legal bond council. That's done for, by the law department. Okay. Further discussion on the comptroller's report. So I, I want to just highlight a couple things. One is we have a special meeting uh, with the Hay Group on October 3rd. We have yet to set a time for that. Yes, they they would, uh, question to the chairman, is it a one item uh, meeting? Current. Okay, they they have a potent, they have 90 minutes uh, budgeted. So their presentation and Q&A will be 90 minutes from start to finish. Does this body have an opinion as to when we start that meeting on October 3rd? I'm open to suggestions now. Let's just get that resolved here tonight. So we can cut down on the series of emails. 536, 630. 536, 630. 630 to 4. 630 to 4. 630 to 4. 630 to 4. All right, we'll schedule that for 6. So 6 p.m. October 3rd, we'll, we'll meet with the Hay Group. Okay, and, and the last point that I want to make, um, again, is we take for granted everything that our uh, finance department does, the effectiveness of our finance department. Bottom of page four, and, and, and it's, it's typical of our comptroller to not mention this uh, except note in his report. But in fact, uh, again, uh, the town of Greenwich has been awarded the Government Finance Officers Association um, of United States and Canada comprehensive annual financial report uh, for the year ending June 30th, 2010, uh, their certificate of, of achievement. And again, you, you and your department should be commended for that. And, and we, we, we are awarded this every year, uh, but it really is a testament to the work that you do and the work that the finance department does. Uh, so again, thank you, and, and, and I'm glad that again we're being recognized for that. You're How many welcome. consecutive years have we received that? 49? <laughs> We're not sure. It's, it's either 49 or 50. I have to look at the CAF where we put the number in there. Any changes well. you make since those earlier reports? Uh, the most dramatic change was GASME 34, where the whole format of the CAF uh, was completely changed, which was about seven or eight years ago. And, and the other uh, important point to note uh, out of this report, and as, as the comptroller indicated, was this. this notion of reviewing those contracts that are under BET purview. Uh, years ago, decades ago, um, the town would let lapse these contracts and we would constantly simply renew our contracts with our vendors without any, any real market analysis. And so um, the control over the last couple of years has been directed to formulate a, uh, a, a plan, a timeline and have them come up uh, for <laughs> renewal or for review, I should say, uh, whatever the, the norm is for that industry. Most of them are on a four or five year cycle, um, and now they just routinely come up as a matter of practice, and I think that served the town well. Even if we stay with the same vendor, it forces that vendor to go back, check itself against the market, uh, and come back with, with usually uh, better, better pricing. And so uh, I commend you for that. Thank Again, you. I think it serves the town well in doing that. Further discussion? All the, uh, is there a motion to approve the Comptroller's Report? So moved. A move by Ms. Tarkenton, second by Mr. Norton. 
Discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Proposed abstention 11-0-0. Thank you. Uh, sure. Do you want to make a motion? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we take um, uh, an item out of order under new business, the approval of the um, Comptroller's performance evaluation and salary. So moved. It's been moved by Mr. Pellegrino, second by Mr. Mason to take the item out of order. All those in favor signify by um, discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstention? 11 0, 0. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make the following uh, put forth the following uh, resolution. Uh, resolve that the Comptroller's salary be increased from $174,338.52 to $177,460, effective July 1st, 2011, uh, uh, predicated upon the acceptance of the evaluation uh, and the controller's performance. That's been moved by Mr. Pellegrino. Second. Second by Mr. Raymer. Discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. I will also note on, on this item, as you can tell, I'm not running again, so it's like important for me to tell you all of this so that somebody <laughs> retains some of this. Um, we, we took the, um, the comptroller and the assessor pursuant to the uh, uh, charter were really on off basis. Uh, our MC employees are all given raises uh, or reviewed, I should say, uh, on a uh, fiscal year. And for, uh, for decades, uh, for as long as anyone can remember, the comptroller and the assessor were off cycle, and they were appointed, uh, and will still be appointed uh, at our January meeting, but their salaries were then um, uh, reviewed uh, and evaluated at the end of every calendar year. Well, this creates problem one, it always happens right around the holiday period, and two, when a, when a board comes to the end of its term, it's trying to evaluate uh, in that given year. What we've done is we've pushed the assessor and the comptroller to the fiscal year cycle, which would give an opportunity to be in mid-year, mid-cycle in the summertime where there's more time to address these types of issues. And we think it's a better fit and it's consistent with all the other MC employees. So I think it's been a good shift and, and it's an area that actually uh, Ms. Barton uh, was uh, critical in making happen. So uh, I think I think we've now caught up. Uh, we, we're now on cycle, uh, and we'll evaluate the comptroller and the assessor next July. So, okay, item seven now comes before us: the treasurer's report. Is there a motion to approve? So moved, uh, Mr. Chairman. Before we approve, I like to hold on. <laughs> um, moved by Mr. Simon, second by Mr. Norton. Discussion. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to compliment the Treasurer on being able to get us uh, approximately 40 basis points uh, income on, on most of the accounts that we maintain. Wish I could get that in the money I want. Mr. Simon. All right, so on the Treasurer's report, where's the $29 million we collected in June for current year taxes? It's at the top. Is that in $129 million? It's, if you go to page two? Yes. It's in the $72 million. So it's in the $129 at the bottom? Yes. So what I'm trying to calculate, we collected $29 million in taxes. The $111 is mostly taxes to the general fund. Not all, but mostly. Yes. So that says we've only collected $140 million in taxes so far this year. Is that accurate? Uh, she, she met some of these numbers when she does wire transfers. So you can't, no, you need to go to the tax collection report or the revenue run to get the exact amount of, of the taxes collected. And our goal here was to send out tax bills of about 158 half of real estate, all of personal property, all of automobile. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to get some sense of how much we've collected in taxes, having gotten rid of the tax collector's report. All right, thank you. Further discussion? All those in favor of the treasurer's report signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention, 11 
Items 8, 9, and 10 now come before us. Those are the BET Standing Committee reports, the BET Liaison reports, and the BET Special Project Team reports. You should have received some written reports, and there might be some, um, Just one. some oral reports uh, here tonight if anyone has uh, any of the comments mm -hmm. from any of these uh, areas. So with that, I will open it up. Are there questions or comments regarding any of these reports? Okay. Item 11 now comes before us, the Chairman's report. So one of the items that has come uh, to my attention has been uh, the issue of whether or not um, what, we, what we collect, what we send out in tax bills versus what we uh, use as our as the basis for setting the mill rate uh, and the grand list, and so in order to not create another uh, committee or another liaison report, I will ask the uh, the reval committee because they meet with the assessor anyway. If you could also take that matter up with Ted, uh, I've discussed it with them briefly, um, and. Um, his claim is that he has reconciled it with the tax collector, um, and maybe even to the better of the town. So if, if, if before the end of the calendar year, we could get a response from Ms. Tarkenton and you, Mr. Finger, on that issue. I know um, others of the board have, have raised that, and so I think um, they should first meet with Mr. Geiger. I think we've uh, come a long way to understanding what we know and what we don't know. Um, but part of the process needs to be to to educate the rest of the board regarding the those. Process. And Mr. Geiger is just a perfect person to hold those kind of sessions with them. We hear Mr. Simon. <laughs> <laughs> On top of that, obviously, we're going to be looking, and we will have in our in a future meeting uh, again before the end of the term is a discussion on the reval, uh, not only what took place from the from the BAA perspective, but also what's the recommendation for moving forward. That's obviously one of the more critical aspects of the assessor's department, and we're looking to give some direction to uh, the assessor. Um, over the past month, obviously, uh, Nathaniel Witherell has uh, dominated uh, the conversation. Uh, uh, Misa too was uh, an important aspect, but um, Nathaniel Witherell was probably the, the, the area that uh, took up most of my time over the last month. Um, for those who follow the BET agendas, you will know that the budget committee meeting last week, the budget committee did take up Nathaniel Witherell, Project Renew. There was a lengthy discussion concerning it. It is not on our agenda tonight uh, for good reason. Without going into the uh, long-winded version of how we got here today, we have a consultant, HDG, who has reviewed the business plan for Project Renew, uh, a special project team made up of four BET members, some representatives from the RTM, and Nathaniel Witherell will be uh, having a, a conference call with HDG regarding their final report, uh, which I can say is um, very different from their uh, preliminary report in terms of the numbers. Um, we then intend to come back, at least the members of the BET on that special project team intend to come back, uh, probably give at least a, uh, a review of that, uh, of our assessment or review. Uh, then we intend to hold a public hearing in October for the, before the BET, um, and then have a vote on Nathaniel Witherell Project Renew in November. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, Nathaniel Witherell will continue to work its way through planning and zoning. My understanding is they're in uh, their October agenda, I believe. Uh, and there'll be a public hearing there as well, as my understanding is that's the process there. Uh, and then, uh, although I haven't received a verification of this, but I believe Nathaniel Witherell will submit Project Renew to the RTM for its October call as more of a first read without an expectation of it actually going to a vote, and then ha asking the RTM to take up the vote at its December meeting to give the RTM members effectively from September all the way until December to make sure that any questions are asked 
so that at the December meeting there's not a, hey, why is this being rushed through, or we didn't get our, our answers, questions to our answers, answers to our questions. So I think it's a it's somewhat of an elongated process, but it affords this important project to get its fair share of public hearings uh, and deliberations. If you have any comments relative to the HDG report, if you can get them to us before tomorrow, that would be helpful, before people on the project, the special project team. And if not, there's obviously going to be time thereafter. I do not anticipate having HDG come back and speak to us. Uh, I think the report will, have, will speak for itself. The difference between the reports, while uh, vast in parts, uh, I think we will hopefully get explanations regarding those. We already have received some explanations from HDG, but I don't think it's necessarily good use of taxpayer funds to bring them all the way back to, to give us another presentation when we have the report in writing. Um, that and uh, we continue to work with the, especially with the law department, or I do, relative to MISA and the implications regarding the state and the federal government's uh, uh, involvement in that arena. Uh, and so we worked for resolutions in, in that as well. Um, and so that concludes my report for the month or so. Which brings us to item 12, uh, adoption of policies and procedures. So in this, we're also going to deviate slightly. We have been talking about policies and procedures for several months now. Uh, Mr. Finger and Mr. Pellegrino, you've uh, presented to us uh, a, a whole binder. That binder has been amended, uh, mainly grammatical changes, some other slight nuances. Um, uh, you know what, I did not. Roland, can you make some copies of this? No, no, no. That's and recently, the law department issued a memo, uh, and that's what I asked Mr. Geiger if he could just make a few copies of them. My understanding is not everyone received that. Um, surrounding uh, the main issue of the Policies and Procedures Manual, which has to do with appropriations and votes needed, the charter, uh, whether it's seven votes or seven individuals, what is an appropriation, whether it's is a budget an appropriation, what is it to, to make an appropriation, uh, what is it to amend an appropriation or simply amend a budget. And so while Mr. Uh, um, Geiger is making those uh, uh, copies, I thought it wise to at least bring to the forefront tonight, because we've talked about it for months now, uh, this threshold issue, which is really the only issue that has have had any considerable debate regarding our policies and procedures. Um, and I know the law department is here to discuss this, and hopefully what can happen after tonight's discussion is then we move past the substantive issues, um, and then next month we will uh, hopefully adopt as a matter of uh, just a vote the policies and procedures. However, if in fact this debate continues, we will certainly take it up again in October uh, at our regularly scheduled meeting. So with that, um, I know, Eugene, you've been at the fore of this, so maybe you want to take the podium? Uh, or Wayne? Wayne? Okay. I was trying to provide Wayne with some cover. He flipped a coin and I lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, Obviously, can take judicial notice that on these kinds of issues, Mr. McLaughlin is much brighter than I am, so that's okay. I keep him close at hand. Now, and also just to set the stage, I know that you've had several conversations with individual members of the BET, especially those who have had who have taken a particular interest in this item. Um, I know you've had sometimes even more than one conversations with these individuals we have. Uh, on the BET, to all to try to understand the issue and understand then, have us understand what the, the charter says. You know, as, as we have a lot of attorneys up here anyway, even those who aren't practicing attorneys have given their opinion about the charter. Um, and so, um, it's I leave one, it up It's to one you. of those issues, Mr. Chairman, where uh, although 
on its face it may seem fairly simple and direct. Uh, when you then sit and talk about it and you throw back and forth hypotheticals, peel back that onion a little bit, it becomes a little more convoluted. We have met with your subcommittee chairman way back. Uh, we have uh, met with uh, many of your members or at least talked with them by phone, as you indicate, a number of times. Mr. Raymer, in particular, uh, has been very helpful, as the other members have, and we do appreciate the input because it's not a simple line in the sand, yes or no. I think, uh, I, I like to think uh, that the memo that we had worked on and had submitted to you uh, is fairly simple and straightforward. Simply put, I'll give you the scenario where I understand the question to arise. Let's pick on the law department for sake of discussion. Uh, the law department has a budget, has a number of individual line items. Uh, the budget committee through Mr. Mason and his group uh, submits it to your full board. You then come to your decision day and your full board goes through the various departments one item at a time. You then get to the law department. And let's assume for the sake of argument, outside counsel which in the last year is in, in round numbers approximately a million dollars. A motion is made uh, to reduce that appropriation by $100,000. Motion's made, it's seconded, it's before your board. Uh, one of the questions that the group had uh, was what vote do you need on that? Uh, and it is our opinion that you need a majority vote. So if theoretically uh, the vote were 651 hypothetically, uh, that uh, amendment would have been adopted and the board then has before it not a million dollars but nine hundred thousand dollars. It is also, our, and, and, and uh, Jeff Raymer and I and, and Gene, and, uh, we've had some, some very good discussions and I, I mean this, uh, I'm not trying to compliment him, but we had some very good give and take uh, on which we disagreed on a couple of issues. Uh, but I think, it, I, not but I think it is our opinion that in that scenario, six votes, six, five, one, would mean that that motion to amend had been adopted. I think when we had talked with Jeff about this on a couple of different instances, his concern uh, was that when you look at that section of the charter, I think it's section 22, uh, 22C, which uses the word determine, I think initially it was Jeff's opinion that that meant you need a seventh vote for that. We are of the opinion that that is not the case, and I think, I respectfully submit, that I think at this point, based on our discussion last week, that Jeff agrees with that and agrees with it based upon uh, what we think is a fairly simple and direct reading of Robert's rules, uh, which talks of the fact that if you make a motion to amend, uh, there is required only a majority vote. I'm reading from section 12-7, even in cases where the item to be amended takes a two-third vote for adoption. Here, Normally, the approval of the item would take seven votes, but on a motion to amend, it is our opinion that it will only require a majority. Now, let's assume for the sake of this discussion that you now have a scenario where your board has before it not the million dollars, but the $900,000. It is our opinion that for that amount of money to be approved for that department, you, once the amendment is adopted, then you need a seventh vote for that or it doesn't go on to the RPM. Now, the next scenario, which, which I, I think you probably would raise, what if, in fact, it doesn't get the seventh vote? Then, in my opinion, in our opinion, at that point, that item fails. The entire budget doesn't, the entire law department budget doesn't fail, but that item would be zero. The debate centers around the concept of does that constitute a failure to appropriate <coughs> under Section 24 of our charter? In our opinion, it does not. So you can move to amend, needs majority vote, needs a seventh vote to appropriate that money. And if in fact it doesn't get the seventh vote, then that item fails, that item is zero. But the, the rest of the budget for the law department can go forward if, if, uh, for the final seventh vote uh, to pass it on to the RTM. I think as I understand it, that has been one of the basic issues or, for lack of a word, stumbling blocks uh, for your subcommittee. Thank you. So let me just restate it just so that everybody's on the same page and then, and then if it's okay with you, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of what the issues are yes, sir. and we'll open it up because I think it's, it's while we've all had or several of us have had independent uh, conversations with you, the reason for tonight is to try to broaden that, make sure everybody at least understands the various positions so that either we agree or disagree.
disagree and, sure. and then next month we can take this to a vote uh, based on uh, in part on your opinion at least relative to this one issue so um, in, in, in the hypothetical that you laid out you used a relatively easy issue though it's it's outside counsel and so outside counsel for the law department would be at zero under your hypothetical yes okay so it got it was reduced originally from a million to nine hundred and then it comes to a vote and in theory that vote is six six so now it's at zero. And what normally happens is we then vote on the law department's budget as amended, right. uh, just as a matter of practice. I think it's code uh, department 140. Is that amazing, 140? So that comes to a vote. Now in theory, now in theory one could argue that if someone is, if, if, if so those same six individuals, VP members, are still aghast that, that it's now at zero, so it went from 900 now down to zero, does not approve the entire law department's budget. So that vote is 6-6. Six, six. Let me stop you there for a moment if I could. Because there are, I think there are a couple of ways to approach it. Let's assume for the sake of argument, the motion to amend passes. Okay. So we're at 900. So we're at 900,000. For outside counsel, For outside counsel, yes, sir. One way to deal with it that I would suggest for your group is at that point on that item, you take a vote. If on that item you don't get a seventh vote, then that line item of a million dollars reduced to 900,000 gets zero. That does not mean that the entire law department budget would fail. The law right. department budget could still be approved with salaries and all the rest that goes with it, uh, but that item for outside counsel, uh, you would have zero. But historically, we then say after all of the amendments to the particular departments we historically have said law department budget as amended and we vote on the law department's budget if in fact you did it in that manner right and that did not get the seventh vote then in that scenario i think that's dangerous but in that scenario <coughs> the law department would have a zero budget and so then but there would be no law department. Uh, unfortunately, that's true. <laughs> Expanding <Sorry>. that, though, <laughs> trying to follow. If we, if they would have no money. You were hypothetical. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. It was. If it wasn't, then, so we, we don't say law department budget as amended. We go through the rest of the budget. So the only amendment we make to the entire budget is this council piece, and so it's at zero. Okay. All right. At the end, we also then say. The budget as amended. Okay. Now I suspect if those same six wanted to hold the budget hostage over this one line item, and you still had six six votes, would then you fail to act on the entire budget? In that scenario, and we've had some discussions with Larry Simon on that, in and we get into questions of policy and responsibility, which I'm not going to pass judgment on. But in that scenario, where you get to a point where you're taking the vote on the final budget, if that is six and you don't have the seventh vote, six, five, one, let's say, and you don't have the seventh vote, then the entire budget is not approved. At that point, I would argue, under Section 24, yeah. last year's appropriations go forward. Okay. So once again, just to make it clear, and then I'll open it up. It's it's. An appropriation that doesn't pass reverts to zero, not last year's budget, unless the entire budget doesn't pass, at which point you would, uh, uh, your opinion is that we, we then fail to take action on the budget and it reverts to last year. So back to your hypothetical. And I, I, think, I think that is correct, because if you didn't follow that scenario, as a matter of policy, you would never be able to cut a line item. Everything would revert and revert and revert. And so... If you did want to quote unquote hold that one line, hold the budget hostage for that one line item, it, it would it and it would revert back to whatever last year was. So outside council fees, let's say that they were 800 the previous year, then it would revert to the 800. In, in that scenario that you've outlined, yes, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Pellegrino was first, then Mr. I saw Mr. Mason, then Mr. Raymer, and then Mr. Baker. So, uh, Wayne. Um, just one other assumption. Let's just assume the 
law department budget is $5 million. It's outside counsel's one. Well, you're looking to God's ears, but that's right. <laughs> uh, so I, I, wanted to, I wanted to put it in the most favorable light as possible. Um, where, I'm, where I'm losing you is on this uh, thing. Okay, the amendment can pass on simple, on a simple majority vote. Yes, sir. Including a tiebreaker by the chairman. Yes, sir. Okay. But that does not mean that we've taken the vote yet on appropriating that line item. That's a separate vote. Yes, which sir. is what I understand you say. And and that's the vote that requires seven votes, which again could include the chairman's tie-breaking vote. Yes, sir. Okay. We can't get there though with a simple majority because six doesn't work. So by definition, it's either going to be a tie-breaking vote that's going to get us there if it's a six-six tie or we're nowhere because it's not going to pass as an appropriation. Correct. Now your your next step is to say, okay, that line item now. But can we? I'm sorry. Can I, can I, I I didn't think that that either you meant what you said or that I heard it correctly. Okay. That is, you said once we've got the amended provision in front of us, that a chairman's tie-breaking vote would pass it. But I thought the point was it would not. That as an appropriation, you would you have to have seven individual would, votes, not a chairman. Tiebreaker no, no, I don't agree with that. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Okay. You, you can have the Glad seven vote as the chairman. The tiebreaker is would still be applicable. Okay, right. good. Now, that, that's in, a in very important opinion. point. I want to yeah. get that one on the table. But but where I want to go is now your next step. We cannot muster the seventh vote um, on anything. No, I'm still on this special ca okay. outside council for one million dollars, right. and therefore you're saying your your recommendation to us is that. That line item now has been basically taken out of the budget. It's zero. That is our opinion. Yes, However, sir. we now, any member has the right to bring up a request to vote on the department for the law department. So your $5 million budget that we're voting on now is really a $4 million budget because you're saying, by definition, we could not agree on appropriating the change, the amendment, to outside counsel. Therefore, that goes to zero, guys. Uh, ladies, um, it's now a $4 million budget in front of us. Wait. Now, now we have, we have to go there in a moment. Okay. Understood. But let's so we, suppose true. we don't get there. We still, we, we go to zero. So now we have the vote on the law department budget. Right. We, 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 let's say we, if we pass it, it's done. It's $4 million. Yes, sir. If we don't pass it, the entire law department budget is now at zero. It's zero. Yes, sir. All right. So, so the real issue here is at which layer of the votes uh, the disagreement amongst us is going to get so far pushed down the road that we're either going to blink or we're going to say, sorry, we're not willing to go forward with it. Well, I think you would hope, uh, let's assume for the sake of discussion, uh, that the, the million down to 900,000, that amendment passes but you cannot get a seventh vote. So the option is you don't get a seventh vote and that outside council item is zero. It is my opinion that it would not inhibit a member from making a second amendment to say not 900,000, I'm just making up examples here, not 900,000, but 950 or 975 or 800. But you would still have the opportunity to amend and change that uh, to avoid the zero. So we have we have a, a political process that we can try to keep kind of compromising through a voting mechanism. Correct. Let me ask you this, Cliff. I thought uh, I'm not a lawyer, but so uh, people say that with such pride. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, but I always thought that there was a provision in the charter that if we did not pass a, an item uh, regarding operating part of the budget that would revert back to the previous year's budget. We do not interpret a motion to amend a line item as a failure to adopt the budget. If in fact you had the scenario that the chairman referred to where at the end of the day you cannot muster more than six votes for the budget, then that is a failure to project to the RTM. Okay, so but my question then, Wayne, is, is why, why is not the failure to approve the law department's budget because we could have a vote on the law department's budget and it could fail at zero because we could not get the seventh vote for it. But we then could come to the full budget and we could say we're going to approve the full budget but the 
law department's budget is zero. Why wouldn't it revert back to the previous year's budget? Because I think you've got to look at what the intention of that section 24 is. And in our opinion, the intention of section 24 is the failure to act. A reduction of a particular department, a reduction of a particular line item is in our opinion not a failure to act. It's a reduction. And if you interpret it any other way, then it's our opinion that you would, if you take that away, then you're never going to be able to reduce an item. Because if you follow that scenario and you, 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 fit, you, you, you think law department ought to be eliminated because it's not doing its job. We're, we're going to go outside council. We're going to eliminate the whole law department. We get, we're, we're giving them nothing. We're putting them out of business. If you didn't interpret it the way I am, then you'd never be able to get them out of business. But that They'd I am, go back to last year. But I then interpret what you're saying is because I can't muster the seven votes for appropriating something, I've not failed, and I've actually reduced your department to zero. Yes, yes, sir. That's our interpretation. Okay, I find that I find that stunning, but that's okay. Yes. All right, <laughs> Mr. Mason. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Wayne and Jean for their time. So, in looking for the solution to this, uh, let me just ask a few questions. We have a department with a number one hundred and forty. We have major object codes within your department. You have a 100 major object code, which is where your outside council lies. Each major object code is built up of what we used to call EOCs or line items, correct? Yes, sir. So your outside council happens to be one small line item within a major object code within a department. Correct. The, the, the million dollars that we want to reduce to 900. So the challenge has always been, and I'm looking for the solution, the BET has chosen in the past to approve by department. And if a member during the process of approving the recommended uh, changes from the budget committee came along and a member of the BET said, I would like to, in the law department budget, in the 100 major object code, I'd like to reduce outside counsel from 1 million to 900,000. So what you're saying is if we chose, and we had this 6-6, six, 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 whatever the, the numbers are, and it reverted to zero, anything within that major object code would revert to zero because we only choose as a BET to a review and approve by, RTM members should be listening to this, review and approve by department and major object code. However, if we were approving by department, major object code and EOCs, expense object codes, then we could specifically take the $100,000 out of the million, make it 900, and if the vote went zero, only that particular light item would go to zero rather than the whole major object code. And my, my position assumes, and this I think is, is, is further response to Joe Pellegrino's comment, my position assumes that the board, working as a board, and making policy decisions knows the consequences of their actions and, and, and may get to a point where a zero is not good for outside counsel or zero is not good for the law department. But you need, in my opinion, the authority and the ability to get there if you deem that appropriate. And any other interpretation would prevent you from getting there. So I'm sitting there in the law department saying, okay, let them, let them cut the million bucks. I don't care. I get last year's 800,000. It takes away your authority. And I don't think that was ever the intention of the drafter. So if the BET at the, what month did we approve the budget? In March. In March, sat down and said, okay, we're going to approve the budget by department, by major object code, and by individual line items. And we chose to do that. And we ran into an issue. It would be just that line item that would be reduced to zero if that came up, not the whole major object. That so if you've got, yes, okay, so <laughs> it's about process. Well, you've been here for four days, passing your Well, I, that's exactly <laughs> right. I'm glad Mr. Simon said that because in, in order of being expeditious, we choose as a working board to say, okay, look, we have the big sheet, the one that's posted in the newspaper. We run down that by department, and if somebody has something, we typically go by the major object code. However, major object codes contain a lot of small line items so it's our choice. We can 
there is a simple remedy to this. It might be a lengthy process, but there is a remedy to it. Otherwise, you would then reduce the whole major object code, as you're saying in your opinion. Yes, sir. Mr. Raymer. Yep. A few things, if I may. First of all, my thanks to Gene and to Wayne for the time they spent. Uh, I certainly bent their ear off at length and endless correspondence and whatnot. You spent a lot of time, and I thank you for that. We, we enjoyed think, it. We appreciate your input. I, I think there's a couple of footnotes that need to be made. Uh, for one thing, I think it's incumbent upon this body to formally make a decision as part of its policy and procedures process to adopt Robert's Rules and Order, Robert's Rules of Order as its mechanism. It's a point that I made to Bill Finger, uh, and I hope that Bill will take it up. Because the point that we reached with Wayne and Gene is entirely predicated upon that. I troubled greatly over the word, as Wayne pointed out, greatly over the word determined. Seven affirmative votes shall be required to determine the proposed appropriation, says Section 22C. If we adopt Robert's Rules of Orders, I think it becomes an overlay to it. And Robert's Rules of Order is very clear on a couple of points. One, the point that Wayne made, and that, that is that even if the principal question under our charter requires a certain vote, in Robert's Rules of Order, they use the example of a two-thirds vote. The subsidiary motions to modify, to shape it, do not require that <coughs> vote. They require only a majority vote. And that was section 12 out of Robert's <coughs> Rules. And once we've adopted Robert's Rules, then it was based upon that, that I, in my dialogue with Gene and Wayne, that I accepted the notion that even though our charter talks about seven affirmative votes to determine the appropriations, once we've adopted Robert's Rules, I thought that likely then a motion to modify uh, a, an appropriation, not yet approve it, but to modify it, required only the simple majority in accordance with Robert's Rules. I still trouble to some extent, though, it's that Robert's Rules then is running afoul a little bit of this word determined. And Robert's Rules is also clear that although you could have Robert's Rules, you can by charter choose to vary the application of Robert's Rules. And the thing I was troubling over is whether or not the word determined was strong enough that it overwhelmed Robert's Rules, but I relented on it in the end. The other point to be made is Robert's Rules is also very clear that abstaining votes are ignored for the purpose of determining a majority. So where you had a 12 people assembled on a panel, as we are, and the vote is 6-5-1, if you had a question in your mind about whether those six are a majority, Robert's Rules is very clear. You ignore the one abstention, so you only have 11 people actively voting, and six votes is a majority of the 11 that are exercising their power of vote. Did you follow that? And so uh, my principal point is I wanted to show those two concepts, but I wanted to, it to be understood that my acquiescence in the end on this question of determine as opposed to Robert's Rules, that certainly at a minimum is predicated upon this body deciding that we want to adopt Robert's Rules, as most organizations do. But most organizations who use Robert's Rules make it part of their charter or bylaws or whatnot that we're going to conduct our meetings under Robert's Rules. Secondly, in response to the point that Joe was raising, troubling over, I think, was the point in, our, in Section 24. Section 24 says by its terms that it applies only if the board, meaning the BET, fails to meet, to act and meet its responsibilities under Section 22. Section 22 requires that this body consider the appropriations that it wants to recommend, pass the ones that's going to pass, and deliver to the town, town clerk, as amended, to the town clerk, the statement of the appropriations. If we choose in the appropriations that we select and in the statement that we deliver to the town clerk to reduce poor Wayne's budget to zero, that's our statement. Those are our appropriations. We didn't fail to act. Section 24 does not apply. It doesn't invoke the budget from last year. We didn't fail to do anything. We did exactly what we intended to do, and what we intended to do was to reduce Wayne's budget to absolutely zero. Uh, also, on Mike's point, we are, the fact that we deal with major object code is a question of our pleasure and convenience. There's nothing that keeps us from, by the way, the same motions to amend requiring a simple majority to take a major object code and decide that on that particular item, we want to break it down to its 11 components and take the 11 components one by one. And so although the budget came to us as a major object code, 
on a motion from Michael Mason, seconded by Leslie Tarkington. We're going to take a uh, major object code 140, and we're going to break it down to its 11 components. Let's take them one by one. And on majority vote, majority vote, majority vote, we will make that change. But when it comes time to approve each of those now subsidiary points, since they now become separate appropriations, each of those little separate appropriations will now require seven affirmative votes to pass. Uh, so I don't think that that's uh, particularly a problem. I think it was fairly clear the way it ended up. The only point that I ended up with is a slight conflict, and I raise this just for the progenies who follow us later on. There's this slight conflict between Robert's rules that allows majority to amend an amendment can be an, an enormous amendment. It can take a $30 million appropriation and it can reduce it down to a dollar and a simple majority is sufficient for that. And the only point that the minority then gets to play on is whether they want to approve or disapprove the $1 that now has been offered for appropriation. And that's a thorny issue, but speaking as a minority party, that's the burden that the minority party has to carry on to this board. Um, Mr. Finger, but before I... I turn it over to you. Mr. Pellegrino um, shared with me that in the preface, it does describe Robert's rules and says that the board will, in fact, sorry, follow I Robert's rules. That. And so the only point I want to make is if you can revisit the preface, if that's insufficient in the wording that's there now, make sure that your, your suggested changes get to Mr. Pellegrino and Mr. Finger prior to the next meeting, and that way um, we've addressed that, but it's already contained in there at least to some degree, maybe it's just insufficient for your purposes. No, no, I, I apologize. I, I, I failed to note that. I'm sure it's adequate, but I'll take a look back at it. Fair Thank you very much. Mr. Finger. Thank you for pointing it out. Perhaps it's page four, it does in fact indicate Robert's rules apply unless otherwise set forth in the charter statute or our, our, our policies and procedures. Wayne, I want to go back to your hypothetical. Yes, sir. And um, I guess this would be question to direct both to you and to the chair. It's a, it's a process question. Maybe Mr. Mason as well. Um, just you had a question. You, you made a comment about process. Assuming the motion is made to reduce outside counsel from a million to 900,000, we understand majority is required to pass or defeat that motion. Assume yes, it, it passes. Mm -hmm. 651, we'll call it. Now there's a, now we have a vote on that amendment. So now we're voting for $900,000. Correct. So, and that needs seven votes. Yes, sir. If it does not get seven votes, mm -hmm. it goes to zero. From a procedure and a process standpoint, is somebody from this board then able to make another motion mm -hmm. to amend that zero now to, I'm going to choose the number, 950,000, we go through the process again. So we don't have to get all the way to the very end right. of the whole budget process. Correct. Okay. In my opinion, they would. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, then I, I just want to clarify something, if it needs clarification. Again, following your hypothetical, if it, the motion doesn't motion passes, reduced to nine hundred thousand, that appropriation is not approved, so it goes to zero. And then those who are not in favor of the reduction decide to vote down the entire budget. The entire budget. Okay. Well, when it comes down to needing seven votes yes, to sir. approve the budget, mm -hmm. we don't approve the budget. You said then we revert back to the appropriation from the prior year. Your hypothetical was 800000 I want to point out that now it's not just that, but it's the entire budget that we have voted down. Everything in the budget, every department, yes, reverts to the prior year. I agree. That would be under Section 24. Right. Yes, sir. Sure. Did you clarify that? Mr. Chairman, may I raise make one point? I'm sorry to speak twice. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, did you see anything in the charter that calls for there to be the departmental vote at the conclusion that when we've gone through the major object code of the law department, it's been our custom to then have a vote on the assembled appropriations as I look back at the charter, I'm left with the impression that that may be a gratuitous act. Is that your in your opinion too? I think uh, and you can correct me if, I, if I'm getting this uh, wrong, but I, I think the practice and policy, and I think it's a good one, 
in order to avoid any question somewhere down the road and what may be a multiple series of votes along the way. I think it's been the practice at the very end of the day to take that final vote to confirm that on everything that we have before us, we are now approving that and we take that seventh vote. So I, I think that's I think that has been the practice, and I tend to think it's been a good one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, a lot of these are internal. I don't think there's anything in the charter that prevents it or allows it to happen. It's simply an internal control that we do. Some of it's for brevity and some of it's for clarity. So it's and so too with the vote that we take at the very end on the budget as a whole. Yeah. It's not right, the same because, answer. Right. Because things like subjects to release and the like, we we try to take it all so that everybody fully understands all the moving Fair parts enough. within that budget. Fair enough. Um, this Mr. Pellegrino has asked. Chairman, this is Article 2, and Article 2 is silent on that particular point. Mr. Um, I know Mr. Fox has an RTM meeting to go to, and it's Sorry. almost 8 o'clock. So I, I just want I, I want to get all the questions out there now to him, um, once again, more also for the board's sake, so that we understand exactly uh, where, where it is that we are relative to the policies and procedures so that we don't have to have the same discussion next time. Um, so, so with that, I'll call Mr. Pellegrino, and then any other final questions. Further comments or questions? Okay, so let me just talk about the process real quick. Any any comments? This document has been worked over by at least two or three members of the BEP outside of your committee. Three. Three people. So I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that all of the grammatical issues and things of that nature have been addressed. I've asked the I've asked um, Mr. Pellegrino, Mr. Finger to take the bullet points and then maybe even maybe a, a bit of this discussion incorporate those bullet points into the document so that it's crystal clear. Uh, but that's going to be really the only substantive change or change to the document and try to get it out through Elaine as quickly as possible so that if there are questions, again, we can deal with them well in advance of the meeting and, and, and hopefully reach a consensus for our October meeting. That works. Without the need for the law department to be here again. So and if, and if we do want them, we'll bring them back. But sure, my, my, my goal is now that we've taken their budget to zero, we, that we shouldn't <laughs> need them. <laughs> Mr. Chair, are we going to get something that updates the uh, draft that we have received? Yes, yes you're going to get a whole, new, you, a whole new copy is going to be sent to you. Just said that. Get out of the way. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Item 13 now comes before us. New business, the approval of the Hold Harmless Indemnification Agreement for which I call on the Chairman of our Audit Committee, Art Norton. Mr. Chairman, a few months ago, a member of the RTM Claims Committee had sent to you a, <coughs> a request as to whether or not Town of Greenwich agreements included, whether the Town of Greenwich agreements for program activities included a Hold Harmless and Indemnification Clause uh, within them. The Audit Committee received that request and <clears throat> we asked the controller if he would provide to us the various agreements that are pending and uh, existing with the Town of Greenwich. And at that time we asked the Law Department if they rev would review those. The Law Department doing what most attorneys do, they contacted uh, neighboring communities to find out what type of agreements and how they handle this particular issue. We received multiple reports. Uh, completed agreements from numerous communities such as Westport, Norwalk, and Fairfield, and the agreement that's being presented to you is an amalgamation from that, some language changes that were made in committee, and a completed document from the Law Department. And on behalf of the Audit Committee, I so move for approval by this body, the indemnification and release as included in our uh, call for this meeting. Second. It's been moved, second by Mr. Raymer. Yeah. Discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. 11-0-0. Thank you, Mr. Norton. Thank you. Uh, the next item, the approval of the 2012 BET meeting schedule. So, uh, you should have a copy before you. Uh, Mr. Simon, did the January date uh, let's, uh, acknowledge the uh, quandary that we faced in previously? Yes. And the only other question, I received a call today from the tax collector again requested that um, to the extent possible, and I told him that I would bring it up here tonight, that we again move up 
our May meeting to uh, be within days of the RTM meeting as opposed to the next week. So I'm. It's the second one. And obviously, it's it's easier to change it now before we give this to finance to schedule, yeah, as opposed to change it thereafter. So I am I am assuming that the RTM meeting is May 14th. So that would be the 17th. No, the RTM meet the RTM meeting I thought was on the 7th. <coughs> no, it's going to be the second. It's the second Monday. Can't be the seventh. The second Monday is the 14th. They, I don't think it's the 14th. They, oh, it has to be, yeah. It has to be. It has to be. Has second to be what? Monday. The second Monday in May. Right. They have to the 15th, which will, you know. Anyway. We're not sure. It's hard to the 9th. Well, but it, it can't be after the 15th. Can't be after so, so we know that wrong, much. So it's either the 7th or the 14th, and my sense is it's the 14th. I, I don't think it can be the 7th either. So seven days early. They would start their 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 April and budget April. deliberations would be April 30th. April, it's always the second Monday. The second Monday of the month. So, so, the so I think, with that understanding, the next the next day, I mean the 16th. I don't like doing it the next day in case they need to go over. And then, if there are any calculations that need to be taken from the from the budget from the finance department, well, the, the the budget committee is on the 15th. Excuse me. Excuse me. Budget committee meeting, the schedule that was presented to us had the RTM meeting to vote on the budget as May 7th. That doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> I, it may not be right. I'm just saying what it said. Why? It was pushed our committee meeting to April. Mr. Though. Chairman, I have a suggestion. Can we Never recommend did. that we meet on the Wednesday following the RTM meeting? Uh, whether it's the 17th or the 10th? Well, the earlier the better, but I, I mean. It's still late. You still don't want it the 21st. I guess my point is. Well, the budget committee is not going to meet until the 15th, so I'm assuming you'd want to meet after that. Can we, can we right now put it in for the 16th, and if it needs to be then moved up to. That's three days early. Yes, Mr. Simon. Even though I'm not going to be here. Um, based, based upon what I've learned, over the last few hours. I don't, you know, the assessor spends at least one week from the time the um, mill rate is set until he sends a file to the tax collector. Thank you. Now, what the delay is, is, you know, giving him a, uh, a mill rate. Not so much the printing of the bills, but he needs the mill rate in order to calculate the credits correctly. This might not be the best way to think about it. No. However, I know that this year they went out, they were on time. In fact, they were early. And in prior years, it wasn't the case. And we moved it up. And so. Well, they make it the same. But I, I, is, is there a preference between Wednesday or Thursday? Because I think that, I don't think that means a lot. At least it gives another day between budget committee and the full BET, and so it's not three consecutive days in a row. And also the budget committee may request additional information. They may want so to maybe change the 17th? Well, yeah, well, you know, we're not going to do that on Friday the 18th. <laughs> yeah, give Mr. Simon and I a call. <laughs> All right. Um, 17th, is that okay? Thursday. Please, yes, Thursday. Is there a motion to approve as amended? So moved. Moved by Mr. Mason, second by Mr. Norton. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention 1100. OPEB cost transfer resolution now comes before us. Who's here? Mr. Sure. This item was discussed at both the BET Audit Committee and Budget Committee last week. Uh, basically, the, uh, the 
town, BET and the RTM created a trust fund for other post-employment benefits effective January 1st, 2008. And at the time, uh, prior to that, all health care, whether it was active or inactive employees, was being charged in the general fund. Uh, with the creation of the OPEP trust fund, they trans we transferred the health care for retirees and inactive employees to the uh, OPEP fund and failed to transfer their workers' compensation and heart and hypertension costs relative to retirees or terminate employees and their beneficiaries. So at the audit committee meeting and the budget committee, uh, BET budget committee, I recommended and asked the BET to make a motion to authorize me to transfer the cost effective July 1st of 2011, those costs that, which are uh, clearly defined as all kept costs in the documents I handed out last week. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. The motion for Ms. Bocino is as follows. Uh, moved by Mr. Simon, second by Mr. Mason. Effective July 1st, 2011, the cost to be recognized in the OPEB trust will also include all workers' compensation, I'll give this to you, and heart and hypertension health care, pharmaceutical, disability, legal, and related costs considered post-employment benefit costs to retirees, their beneficiaries, and former employees entitled to such benefits. The last paragraph of that sheet. Discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. 11 0 Should that go back to the policy considered? Uh, you can consider that. Okay. Okay. Item 14 now comes before us. Meeting minutes for July 18th, 2011. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Moved by Mr. Raymer. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Tarkey. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. 10 0 1. Any other items to come before us? The meeting is adjourned.